Well, how do there, chums? Tis I, Captain of the Steves, and today, chums, for you guys in the viewerverse, I'm hitting up Dragon's Dogma 2, the last preview, via IGN. Now, this came out four days ago, so I'm a little bit late to the party on this one, but let's jump over onto IGN. Let's make this full screen. It's already in 4K. We're going to hit play. Don't worry, I'm not going to pause this all that much. In fact, I'm just going to let the guy talk, and then I'm going to have my say afterwards let's watch this together people i thought it would be a simple side quest the owner of an apothecary enlisted my help to find his lost grandson who had been taken by wolves as i followed the trail i heard a screeching noise from up above Are we ignoring the enemy tonight? all of a sudden i'm in a battle for my life against a griffin it's a monster that's far too strong for my party to handle, but we fight and claw and hold our ground until finally we get it to retreat. I breathe a sigh of relief, then set up at the nearby camp and sleep till nightfall. That sleep is then interrupted by the same griffin back for revenge. Brilliant! That fight somehow boils over into another battle with a white, who proceeds to beat me within an inch of my life before I finally take him out, just as the sun rises after an epic 20 minute battle. Brilliant. Just like the old days. Nighttime was always deadly. Well, like that. And it comes up with all your stats when you level None up. None of this was part of the actual quest involving saving the boy. It was just a series of events that cascaded into one of the most yeah. unforgettable encounters I've ever had in an open world action RPG. And it was just one of the incredible encounters I experienced during the 10 hours I spent adventuring through Dragon's Dogma 2's fantastic open world. Yeah, I must agree. That's what I loved about the first one. You never knew what was around the corner. You had an idea sometimes with the small mobs, but big guys, they just attack well, I didn't you. I think to start from the very beginning, I did get to begin with the creation of my own pawn. Pawns, for those unfamiliar with the first Dragon's Dogma, are AI-controlled companions that gain gear, skills, and experience from your game, and then take all that with them online where they can be hired by other players to be companions in their own games. I'm not going to spend too much time on either pawns or character creation, especially because we've already made those videos, but what I will say is that pawns are integral wow. to one of my big takeaways, which is that exploration and discovery in Dragon's Dogma 2 feels much more natural than ever before. First and foremost, there are no more quest boards. There are no markers that appear above people's yeah. heads letting you know who's got a quest, and any sort of symbols placed on your map to let you know of points of interest are kept to a minimum. No As more such, quest you'll boards. really rely on your pawns and NPCs to guide you through Dragon Sogma 2's world. NPCs will, more often than not, be the ones to approach you with opportunities for side quests, as opposed to it being the other way around. So, okay. you wouldn't happen to have seen a pretty stone. You there! Did you see an urchin in a cap? Right? Pawns will also point out <laughs> objects of interest. Just yonder looks to be a good spot. An urchin! Boulders that can be destroyed to find a path that leads to treasure. If you need that to destroy, I'm your pawn. Shall I assist? Yes! Or if they already have knowledge of a quest from their owner's game, they will straight up lead you to those quests if you give them the go ahead. Like All of this. this leads to a style of exploration and adventuring that feels very organic and appropriately rewarding, very much in the same way that Elden Ring and the two most recent Zelda games do. As alluded to in the intro to oh. this preview, you also never really know what to expect once you set out to pursue a quest lead. Mm -hmm. The very act of exploring beyond the safety of the city's walls is unpredictable, dangerous, and enticing, which is why it's so exciting. Do so at your own peril. Yes, awesome. Over the course of my 10 hours, I got to play with a total of five vocations. Fighter, Mage, Warrior, Sorcerer, and Trickster, which okay. you can watch a whole other video all about. Unlike the first game, which had you unlocking advanced vocations simply by leveling up the base ones, the two advanced vocations were actually unlocked via a quest. After oh. visiting the vocation guild, I was given a quest to retrieve a greatsword and an arch staff. And after doing so, I unlocked both the warrior and sorcerer vocations. I don't know if all okay. of them will be unlocked this way, and I didn't get a chance to unlock any of the hybrid ones, like Mystic Spearhand or Magic Archer, My but favorite. I definitely like the idea of not having to grind vocations in order to unlock others. My personal uh. favorite of the vocations I got to try was by far the warrior. 
who maintains the fantasy of being the great sword wielding badass that brings giant beasts to their knees with just one charged strike, but also adds a few more tricks to their oh. repertoire. Director Hideaki Itsuno heard feedback that the warrior didn't feel like a super viable vocation in the first game, and thus worked hard to give them some new elements to bring out their strengths. For Sweet. starters, we've jacked up the warrior's offense and destructive power, to the point where it's unfair. In exchange, its abilities take a little longer to execute. This makes the vocation somewhat difficult to use, but that's where the tackle comes into play. Nice. If you attack, you can use the tackle to cause an enemy to be stunned instead of being stunned yourself, making it easier to get into the vocation. The tackle he's referring to is a new ability called Barge that allows the warrior uh -huh. to execute a quick shoulder bash, even while they're charging an attack, to interrupt and potentially stun any enemy that's trying to stuff their attack. The vocation, after all, is built around being able to charge up massively powerful attacks that deal humongous damage, so this small change goes a long way in making it a little easier to get those big shots off. My favorite new addition for the warrior, though, is a passive skill that allows you to swing regular attacks much more quickly if you're able to precisely time your next button press with when the attack actually lands. This Sweet. gives a nice rhythm to the warrior's combat and allows a skilled player to compensate for the typical weakness of having a very slow attack while still making those very slow and powerful attacks still feel like they have their own place in the warrior's skill set. Also, if you're like me and enjoy the feeling of leaping off cliffs and slamming your weapon down on a monster's head, this is the vocation for you. Sweet! I unfortunately didn't get deep enough into the sorcerer vocation to see any of the really big, crazy spells that they're so beloved for, but what I really enjoyed about the sorcerer was the addition of a unique skill called Galvanize. This allows you to go into a stance that recovers your stamina extremely quickly, which is especially useful for the sorcerer due to the fact that their spells take so long to cast. To shorten those spells, you need to use a skill called Quick Spell, which allows you to spend stamina to reduce the spell's cast time. All of this leads to a careful balance of preparing to cast a powerful spell, using Quick Spell to shorten its cast time, and then making note of whether you have enough stamina to cast another spell, or whether you have to break away and use Galvanize to get your stamina back up. It's a fun dance that made Sorcerer feel a lot more active than in the past. That's cool, I like that. It's a bit like Dragon Ball and charging key energy, isn't it? Very nice. Dragon's like Dogma 2's open world is enormous, reported to be roughly four times the size of the already huge map in the first game. And I don't doubt that claim in my experience of checking out the map and wandering through just a small portion of it. It's big, but it's also dense, with exciting encounters both on and off the beaten path that were paced nicely so I wasn't constantly slowed down by back-to-back -back battles, but I also never went too long without having something to engage with. One thing that was important to Itsuno and the team wow. at Capcom was making sure that the players really wow. felt the distance that they were traveling as they explored. To that end, fast travel is very limited like in the first game. You can only travel between discovered port crystals, mm -hmm. and every time you do, you must expend a fairy stone, which are highly valuable items that don't come cheap and aren't easily found. Shall we well, I hope the black cat's still there so you can clone a couple of forgeries. Another option you have for getting around is using an ox cart which is relatively cheap, but they are limited in the fact that you can't choose where you travel. The main one that I found only went from the capital city of Vernworth to the checkpoint town, which was far to the west. Okay. You also have to consider that ox carts are not a completely safe way to travel, as they often will be ambushed by all manners of beasts. Of course, you can just hoof it on foot, which is where you'll truly feel the weight of that distance, especially due to the new health restoration mechanic known as the Lost Gauge. In the first game, you'd be able to heal your entire life bar by using health restorative items yeah. and recoverable gray health with spells. In Dragon's Dogma 2, however, every hit diminishes a portion of your max health, and the only ways oh. to restore it are either by finding a campfire to rest at or returning to an inn and resting for the night. Makes Fortunately, sense. if you rest at a campfire, you can also cook some meat and get some much-needed buffs in addition to restoring all of your life. But there's a risk involved with resting at a campfire as well. The flames may attract monsters to your campsite, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this preview, you could actually wake up to an angry griffin coming back to finish what it started. What it all cool. comes down to is this. Virtually every action in Dragon's Dogma 2 has some combination of a cost and a risk tied to it. Love fairy it. stones are risk-free travel, but they come at a very steep price. Yeah. Ox carts are a low-cost but moderately risky method of travel, and traveling on foot is free but extremely risky. 
then Love you must it. also consider whether it's worth it to press on in a quest line with low max health or backtrack to a town to resupply, whether you should avoid fighting the giant tanky ogre or risk it all on trying to bring it down for both the experience and rare material reward, whether you should keep on the less dangerous beaten path or take a detour into the unknown. In the 10 hours that I played, these were very compelling decisions to have to make. But the real test will be whether those decisions remain compelling or turn exhausting in hour 20 or 30 when the map has expanded dramatically and you still have quests remaining to complete in a town that you're super far away from. Hypotheticals aside though, I love just about every moment that I spent playing Dragon's Dogma 2 during this preview window. It doubles down on everything that I loved from the first game makes some smart improvements to the way quests are handled and how you explore its giant world, and the little taste that I got of the vocations is a tantalizing reminder of why Dragon's Dogma is one of the best in the genre when it comes to delivering on the various power fantasies tied to the classic RPG archetypes. Even after all I played, I still feel like I just scratched the surface on what Capcom has in store for players when Dragon's Dogma 2 releases on March 22nd. Okay, well, that was pretty interesting stuff, wasn't it? So let's um, let's mute that for a second, and I'm just going to jump back over, and I'm going to give him my thoughts and feelings on all of those people. I guess. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. I really like the way that they've rebalanced the warrior, where actually, if you time the buttons just right with the button presses, you can actually go into combos, and the fact that they're a little bit slower now but deal a lot more damage. It feels almost like the great swords inside of Monster Hunter has made it into this in a roundabout way. So if you like playing with the great sword, or the, you know, in Monster Hunter, it looks like it's translated quite well over to here in a roundabout way. So yeah, I'm definitely going to give Warrior a try because before it was just about springboarding people into the air so they could do air attacks and things like that. So I have to agree with the change up on the Warrior. And I also like the fact with the galvanize with the um, sorcerer to get back your stamina bar. And I do like the idea that you need to now rest at campsites and inns to replenish your health bar all the way up. So you need to sort of plan your journey and have campsites. I don't know whether campsite is a consumable item. I did notice though in the premium pack you do get a campsite there. So maybe it's an infinite campsite? Don't know. The fairy stones and the portal system I actually really adored about the first Dragon's Dogma because again you've got to think well where can I strategically place my portal stones to get myself around the map and you could only place about what five I think something like that it wasn't a great deal you could count them on one hand so you had to be really careful with where you place them and strategically place them and I quite liked that so, and to hear that the ox carts only go certain places is also pretty cool it, it makes that it gives that sort of element of realism to travel and i like that whole risk reward and risk and cost type stuff that he mentioned inside of this video i think he's actually done a nice little breakdown for his preview i can't fault it in any way shape or form it's a shame we didn't get to see some of those hybrid classes but at the same time it's also quite nice to learn that you're gonna have to unlock them as you go and they're not just going to be available at some pawn guild and uh, something that you can pick up quite early so yeah I'm actually liking what I'm hearing. Everything that I'm hearing makes us feel like it's going to be a grandiose adventure. The whole idea though that there's no quest boards is a little bit odd. I mean, I used to just love picking up a shed load of quests, just completely clearing the board and have them pop ambiently as I was traveling around the world. It's a shame that there aren't just a few of those sort of quests still in there, you know, like kill a couple of rabbits, kill a couple of birds, because then you're just popping XP as you're adventuring and exploring. So that is a bit of a double-edged sword for me, that one. I would still like to have quest boards of low kind, you know. But yeah, story quests and having people approach you like this NPC that's right behind me here, I really like that. That's pretty darn sweet. And it also cuts away by lots of things and draws your attention to them. So you're not, hopefully you're not going to miss a side quest that's important. Which, in the first Dragon's Dogma... To be honest, I had to hit up a couple of guides not to miss a mission because some of them, you, you just wouldn't guess to talk to that NPC at that particular time. And it could be that that's, that, that breathes life into this title for a long time to come because if you're a completionist like I am, I definitely want to try and do as much as I possibly can inside of Dragon's Dogma 2 and perhaps even platinum it like I did with, Plat with um, Dragon's Dogma the first outing in Dark Arisen.
Liking everything I'm seeing here. I'm liking the improved graphics. Something I have heard, though, that is a little bit jarring is that you can only play this at 30 frames per second, even on the next-gen consoles. And we can see that they're playing on next-gen console right now because all of the controls over in that corner over there have all got like L2, R2, L1, R1 and triangle, square, circle and X. So it's PlayStation 5, I would imagine. But to see that it's running in 30 frames per second... I mean, inside of this footage, you can't overly tell. I mean, there were a couple of frame skips during this actual video that I saw there and a little bit of slowdown. But I don't know whether this is just because it's the pre-release version and there's still a little bit of optimization, a little bit of polish to go in there before March 22nd. But, you know, what I'm seeing, I, I'm happy with, to be fair. I mean, some of the textures have been a little bit, hmm, that's a bit sort of PlayStation 4. Um, but then a lot of it, some of the lighting effects, some of the visual elements, some of the other bits and bobs that I'm seeing, it's definitely looking like it's had that uplift to next gen. And I'm thoroughly looking forward to jumping in and playing from day one. So I will be pre-ordering this. I'll probably be pre-ordering it pretty late in the day, though. I'm probably going to pick it up at the end of Feb. But yeah, I'm... I'm excited for this one. Very excited for this one. And I can't wait to bring it to my channel. And I'm hoping that if you guys have... This is the first video of mine you've seen. You've already smashed that like and subscribe. Heck yes. Um, but anyway, until next time, people. You've been freaking awesome. And yeah, goodbye, goodbye. And goodbye again.